Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14? Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. We're going to, uh, uh, tonight is a, tonight and tomorrow, the last two classes in the book of Zephaniah. We finish it off tomorrow evening, and uh, this evening we'll uh, begin the first of a two-part uh, um, Two parts of the study of uh, Zephaniah 3.20. We'll take it in two uh, installments tonight and tomorrow. And tonight we're going to be looking at the first couple of uh, prophetic statements in the verse which teach that the future restoration of the future remnant of Israel to the land promised to them uh, under the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to see that the, uh, we're talking about the restoration of the, nation, uh, the remnant of Israel to the land that was promised to them under the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenant. So you can just say Abrahamic covenant because the Palestinian covenant, as we'll see, is an extension of that covenant. I break them out just because of the land uh, promises. But um, So that is our subject here this evening, and let's take a moment of silent prayer. And uh, we do this to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. The confession of sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, can, uh, restores us to fellowship. That fellowship, of course, is maintained by bringing our thoughts into obedience to the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures, which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit in Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do it Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 today. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've graciously given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this evening. We thank you for those not only in the Thompson home, but also those who might be viewing or listening to this class through the website, through the recordings, or through the later date, through the recordings on the website. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson's hospitality and opening up their home to us four days a week and the sacrifices involved with that. We thank you for Cheyenne and Titus' work with the sound of recordings the video, the audio, and we pray that you'd give them wisdom in that area this evening. Thank you for their, again for their service and the technology and the people taking advantage of the technology. We thank you for this study on Zephaniah. We pray that you would bless us here this evening. We pray that you would empower me to communicate your word uh, in our study of Zephaniah 320 here this evening. Communicate to your people your, your full counsel and also help your people by the power of the Spirit to learn and understand and uh, uh, apply what they're learning in this class this evening. We pray, Father, that as a result, that you and your son Jesus Christ would be glorified and your people would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, before we get underway, just, uh, just a note, we're going to be looking at a map of the distribution of land among the tribes of Israel during the millennial reign. And that map will be on, in our website under our written library and it's uh, under diagrams, and you can find it there. It's again, it's called, uh, the, uh, deals with the distribution of land among the tribes of Israel during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So we'll be looking at that uh, later here this evening, because we are going to be talking about uh, the Palestinian covenant, uh, the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, which uh, contains promises of land to the nation of Israel. They're unconditional promises, and uh, this is what we'll be talking about here this evening. So if you could look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. We'll pick it up there in context. And remember, verses 14 through 20 are, are talking about the millennial reign of Christ and also the second advent of Christ, which actually precedes the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Thus, the Bible teaches, as we've seen many times, a premillennial view of the, uh, of the second advent. It comes before the millennium, and uh, before the millennium gets underway, we saw several things that go on. Uh, we saw the cleansing of the temple in, the, in 30 days, for 30 days, and then there's another 45 days in which Jesus Christ judges both the, gen the Jews and the Gentiles, and uh, only uh, uh, regenerate people will be remaining, and they'll repopulate the earth. And of course, as we pointed out, 
verses 14 through 20 also talk about this future remnant of Israel that will be existent during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you could say that there are going to be two categories of Jews in a part of this remnant, those that are in resurrection bodies and those that are not. Those that are not are, are those who survived the events of the tribulation, the second advent of Christ. They passed through the judgments. They have trusted in Jesus, and they're, gonna, they're not going to get their resurrection bodies until the, the end of the millennial reign. And uh, they're going to repopulate the earth. That's why they can't get their resurrection bodies uh, uh, like uh, we will have ours. So that, uh, for those who are Jewish uh, believers in Old Testament Israel and uh, those who are martyrs among the Jews, uh, if you were a regenerate Jew during the tribulation period and were killed because of your faith in Jesus, you will have a resurrection body during the millennial reign. Old Testament saints like Moses and Daniel in Israel, they'll all have their resurrection bodies along with other Old Testament saints that were not a part of the nation of Israel, like Noah, uh, people like that, and uh, that were not a part of that dispensation, Abraham. And uh, so uh, these are going to be in resurrection bodies during the millennial reign of Christ. Also, the church will have their resurrection bodies as well. In fact, the next group of people to get their resurrection bodies after Jesus Christ, who's the first fruits and resurrection, uh, is going to be the church, because we're the body of Christ, and we're also the future bride of Christ. So this remnant, of course, the remnant doctrine teaches that uh, in the nation of Israel, God in every generation, in every dispensation of history, will always set aside a certain amount of Jewish believers in the nation that will trust in him, and that percentage could be large or small or in between, and uh, this uh, we'll see, though, at the during the millennial reign of Christ, this remnant will be quite large because you have these resurrected uh, Jews uh, in uh, in uh, Jews resurrection bodies and Jews that are not in resurrection bodies. So you're going to have quite a big remnant. And also, of course, in contrast to the first advent of Christ, at the second advent of Christ, as we pointed out several times. And, uh, the majority of the nation of Israel, majority of Jews, will trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, and he'll deliver them from Satan, Antichrist, the false prophet, and the armies of the tribulation period. So their faith will appropriate the omnipotence of Christ, who will use that omnipotence to defeat their enemies, their oppressors, as we've been studying in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. So with that review out of the way, look at verse 14. I'm reading again from the New American Standard. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Uh, if I could, I'm going to read from the, uh, I think I'll read from the, uh, Today's New International Version, the NIV, today's uh, NIV, and they say, the, they translate the, these verses as follows. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has taken, uh, turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion, do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but I will rejoice, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame, and I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I'll bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So that's verses 14 through 20 of Zephaniah chapter 3 in 
the today's NIV. Now, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, the New American Standard, it says in verse 20, our verse here for this evening, at that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Now, that first prophetic statement, as you can see, begins with a prepositional phrase, at that time. And the word for time there, we've seen it many times in the past in our study of Zephaniah, the word is the noun ayat, which means period of time, because it's referring to the second advent of Jesus Christ, which is indicated uh, to us through a comparison of the assertions in this verse with the prophecies in Scripture related to the second advent. Now, this word is the object of the preposition ve in the Hebrew, which means during, because this preposition indicates something occurs during the time indicated by its object. So during the time of the second advent, that, that, that period in which Christ comes back to the earth and destroys his enemies and Israel's enemies, uh, this is what uh, he's saying he's going to do. The Lord's saying, uh, Zephaniah is quoting the Lord directly. Then it says, I will bring you in. The word for I will bring in is the verb bo in the Hebrew. It means to transport because the word pertains to the transfer of someone or, or something from one place to another. Of course, we have here the transportation of the, the regenerate Jews that are surviving at the second advent of Christ, survive it in the tribulation, and Christ is going to bring them back to the land of Israel. Where, remember, they've been dispersed through the persecution of Antichrist. Now, the second person masculine, plural, pronominal suffix, uh, atem, means each and every one of you. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's translated you here in, the, in your Bibles. It's uh, referring to the remnant of Israel, of course, but it's used in a corporate sense and also in a distributive sense, emphasizing there's no exceptions. No one's going to be left behind, not one single person. That's what the distributive sense is telling us. And then uh, the statement, even at the time when I gather you together, it's actually epexegetical, that statement, because it's defining specifically for the reader when God will transport this future remnant of Israel. So this is how far we're going to go uh, in that verse this evening. So if you could look at my translation of verse 20, it says, during this specific period of time in the future, I will cause each and every one of you to be transported. Specifically, during this specific period of time, I myself will cause each and every one of you in the future to be gathered in one place. So here, we have the prophet Zephaniah, if you notice. He's quoting directly the, the, the God of Israel. And uh, rather than speaking on his behalf as his representative to the Jewish people. Now, this for, first prophetic declaration quotes the God of Israel as predicting that during a specific period of time in the future, he will cause each and every member of the remnant of Israel to be transported. And then he specifies with the second prophetic declaration what he means by this, by asserting that during this specific period of time in the future, he will himself cause each and every member of this remnant of Israel to be gathered in one place. The one place is obviously the land promised to the, the nation of Israel and their progenitors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So therefore, these two prophetic declarations are referring to God, restoring a remnant of the Jewish people to the land he promised to them under the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenants, which we'll be noting here this evening in, uh, uh, quite a bit. Now, the third and fourth prophetic declarations, which we'll note tomorrow, advance upon and intensify upon these first two prophecies. And they assert, the third and fourth declarations, they assert that the God of Israel will cause each and every member of the remnant of Israel to receive honor as well as praise among each and every one of the Gentile nations of the earth when he himself restores their prosperity before their eyes. Now, none of those predictions in verse 20 have ever been fulfilled in history. Why? Because nothing in the past or up to this point in history has ever fulfilled them. Yes, in the past, a remnant returned from Babylon in the 6th century B.C., and a remnant of Jews has returned to the land of Palestine here in the 20th century after being dispersed throughout the earth for almost 2,000 years. However, at no time in history has a remnant of Israelites been transported by the Lord himself and gathered in one place and then have received honor as well as praise from every nation on earth. That's what it's, this verse is saying. The remnant returning from Babylon, if you recall, was mistreated, 
when they attempted to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That's documented for us in the book of Nehemiah. And in 1948, the Jews were attacked immediately by her Arab neighbors when she became a nation again, a political entity with uh, 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 political boundaries. However, according to both Old and New Testament prophecies, the first two prophetic declarations in Zephaniah 3.20 will be fulfilled at Jesus Christ's second advent when he ends the tribulation period and uh, thus the 490 prophetic years, Daniel 70 weeks, in which God is disciplined in the nation of Israel. That will simultaneously bring an end to the times of the Gentiles and usher in a millennial reign where Christ is ruling with, uh, over the earth, both Jew and Gentiles, and Israel is the head of the nations because Jesus, the greatest Jew, the king of the Jews, will be in her midst. So the third and fourth prophetic uh, declarations will be fulfilled during the Lord's subsequent millennial reign. Now, we'll see that tomorrow. But the first two prophecies in verse 20 speak of the Lord transporting a remnant of Jews and gathering them into one place. This regathering of this exiled remnant of Jews will occur when Jesus Christ at his second advent orders the elect angels to bring them back to the land promised to them and their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, if you listened, when, you, when Jesus was in his Olivet Discourse, in Matthew 24 and 25, he says, when the abomination of desolation, you see it standing in the holy place, at the statue of Antichrist, put up by the false prophet, he says, head for the hills. And there'll be a great dispersion of the Jews at that time, and it'll be for three and a half years. And remember, we saw earlier in Zephaniah chapter 3, that these Jews the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7 and 14, who will be born again and saved, they'll evangelize these Gentile nations. And when Christ comes back at his second advent, these, the Gentiles who get saved through the evangelistic efforts of this 144,000 regenerate Jews during the 70th week, they'll bring back as a gift offering to Jesus Christ these Jews that led them to the Lord. So it's going to be a beautiful picture. So also, there's going to be, Christ is going to order the elect angels to regather uh, the, the elect, uh, the, the, those Jews who have trusted in him as Savior and bring them back to the land of Israel. In fact, you can, uh, uh, you can hold your place. Uh, look at uh, Matthew. Look at Matthew 24:15. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 15. It says there, therefore when you see, Jesus, this is all of that discourse, therefore when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Of course, Antichrist is going to sit, Paul mentions that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 4. Daniel talks about this as well that Antichrist will, will sit down and declare himself God, more than likely between the, the, uh, on the mercy seat, the, Ark of the, the rebuilt Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim. Uh, that's what uh, Daniel seems to be describing there in, Daniel, uh, in, in the book of Daniel. Now, uh, there's also, as we saw in Revelation 13, a statue that's going to be built by the uh, false prophet in honor of the Antichrist, and he'll be able to, this thing will be able to move and everything and come to life. And uh, so that, it, it, he's talking about this abomination of desolation. So Christ saying, you see that, you're going to have to flee. Verse 16, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go, go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, but there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Oh, behold, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe him. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sun, sign of the Son of the Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And then he says, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather the, together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Interesting. Uh, could be that the, the, you know, the Feast of Trumpets that is mentioned uh, in those, uh, the seven great feasts of Israel, uh, I used to believe that it had to do with the, the rapture of the church, but those feasts are all related to Israel. And uh, Christ fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, uh, the feast of first fruits fulfilled with Christ is being the first in resurrection. Pentecost, Jewish believers that received the pouring out of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. Uh, you have the feast of the Day of Atonement, which will be on the fulfilled with the second advent of Christ. Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled with the millennial reign of Christ. But then you get to the, what's the Feast of Trumpets? Well, the Feast of Trumpets could be related to just this verse we're talking about when he gathers the Jewish elect uh, saved from around the world. Or it could be, for, I, 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 I'm inclined to believe that it's the, uh, related to those seven uh, trumpet judgment, the, tr the trumpet judgments and re recorded in Revelation uh, chapters 6 through 18 or in those verse, uh, chapters. But it could very well be talking about this as well. So, but it's, either way you slice it, it's, it's got to be related to the Jewish people because those feasts are directed at the Jewish people and they'll have to be fulfilled in some relationship to the Jewish people rather than the church. So I know, and a good friend of mine, uh, a pastor, he believes that, you know, you know the rat, well, it's true that the Feast of Trumpets, it, what is it, in September sometime? So uh, it could be that, uh, you know, Christ will, uh, the, you know, when Christ comes back, it'll be in the month of September or October, wherever it is that Feast of Trumpets falls on. So the, uh, but some people like to think that the rapture will fall in February, uh, that, during September or October sometime. But I don't think the, the Feast of Trumpets is going to be fulfilled with related to the rapture of the church because uh, the Feast of Trumpets was given to Israel. So you're kind of mixing stuff there. And uh, every time it's, any of those uh, feasts have been fulfilled, uh, that we've seen in the past and the ones that are to be in the future, they're all related to Jesus Christ and his relationship to Israel, not the church. So it says in verse 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end, one end of the sky to the other. So Zephaniah 3.20 is predicting this gathering together of this Jewish elect. Now, uh, so this is, this is what we got going on here with the second advent of Christ. That we'll have this regathering of this exiled remnant of Jews, which will occur at his, again at Jesus Christ's second advent when he orders, as we say, the elect angels to bring these Jews back to the land promised to them and their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the second advent of Jesus Christ is taught in both Old and New Testaments, many, many passages. Uh, that we've made it mentioned in the past. If you got my notes, you can see, look up all those passages. Now, this restoration of the future remnant of Israel, which will take place at the second advent of Christ, is uh, this restoration of a few future remnant of Israel to the land promised them under the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenants is echoed in, J in Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, as well as Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 34 and th through 37. So uh, let's look at uh, uh, Amos. Let's go to Amos chapter 9. Look at verse 13. Actually, Amos 9 13. We'll start there. Amos 9.13, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine, and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine, and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land. So there's a restoration of the Jewish people to the land, and they will not again be rooted out from the land. It's, see, it's permanent, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now stop there. We've talked about this in the past. 
There are many people, Christians today, who believe that uh, the nation of Israel will not be restored to the land. That passage says they, it, they will be, permanently. So that's what we call, those people who believe that are called supersessionists or replacement theology. They believe that the nation of Israel is replaced by the church and uh, they take the promises that were given to Israel. That is not the case. That passage re refutes that, along with the passage we're reading in Zephaniah. So uh, the replacement theologians or the supersessionists, they call themselves as well, um, there's a couple of different uh, strains of them. There's different, uh, there is some that believe there's going to be a national regeneration of Israel, uh, where, like we do. And, but there's also those who believe that, but they do not, uh, they do not believe. Uh, there's, some that, uh, there's some that think there's not going to be, so the, uh, back it up, there's some that supersessionists or replacement theologians who say there's going to be a national regeneration of Israel at the second advent, but they're not going to be restored to the land. There's some that say there's no national regeneration and there's no restoration to the land. The, the common denominator is they neither one, they, none of them, think that there's going to be a restoration to the land. And that is, flies in the face of Scripture. To say, that the, uh, to say that the church receives those promises of land given to the Jewish people is an attack on God, God's character and integrity. You're making it sound like what you're doing. The implication is... God, you're saying that God didn't really mean what he said to the Jewish people. See, the Jewish people, ex are the expectation, at least today, even today with Orthodox Jews, and the expectation of the Jewish people in Jesus' day, was they were going to have the land, and they were going to have it permanently, and much, much greater portion of land than they have ever had in their history, even with the Exodus generation, or the, uh, the, the generation under Joshua. Uh, they never even had one, was it one 20th or one 30th the land, I think it was, that they promised to them, because they didn't, didn't, all the tribes didn't have the faith to dis, dispossess the, uh, the Canaanites uh, people. So uh, you know, God means what he says to the Jewish people, and these are unconditional promises. There's no condition attached there. You notice that? If you're obedient to me, I'll bring it. It doesn't have to say, it just says, I'm going to do this. So uh, those who have faith in him and among the Jewish people and a part of this Jewish remnant in the millennial reign of Christ, they're going to receive this land. They're going to receive this promise. They're going to be benefiting from it. So he says, I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from the land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now go over to Ezekiel now. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Look at verse 22, we'll start there. Ezekiel 36, 22. Ezekiel 36, chapter 36, verse 22. Therefore say, Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And Paul mentions this in Romans 2. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land, the restoration of the remnant of Israel. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. It talks about uh, conversion, sanctification, and you will be clean, saved. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, regeneration, and I put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you'll be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save 
you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply it and I will not bring a famine on you I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that you were that were not good and you will load yourselves and your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations I'm not doing this for your sake declares the Lord God let it be known to you be ashamed and confounded for your ways O house of Israel thus says the Lord God on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities at the second advent I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt during the millennium the desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation and the sight of everyone who passes by they will say this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited then the nations that are left round about you will know that I the Lord have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate I the Lord have spoken and will do it thus says the Lord God this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them I will increase their men like a flock like the flock for sacrifices like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast so will the waste cities be filled with flocks of men where are these waste cities in the land promised to them uh, by God uh, through it to Abraham Isaac and Jacob then they will know I am the Lord their God what a great passage so this restoration of a future regenerate remnant remnant of Israel will fulfill the unconditional promises of the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenants and specifically it will fulfill the unconditional promise of land to Abraham Isaac and Jacob who had his name changed by God to Israel and their descendants who like them these three men exercise faith in the Lord now the Palestinian covenant is in fact an extension of the Abrahamic covenant which is recorded in Genesis chapter 12 1 2 3 and was unconditional meaning that its fulfillment was totally and completely dependent upon the Lord's faithfulness not the faithfulness of the Jews in other words even if the Jews are unfaithful and they had been God's still gonna pull this off and give this the land because he has set aside a future group of believers in the nation who will trust in him at his second advent during the 70th week and they along with old other Old Testament saints who trusted in him will take will benefit from this unconditional promise of land so again the Palestinian covenant is in fact an extension of the Abrahamic covenant which is recorded in Genesis chapter 12 1 through 3 and it was unconditional meaning that its fulfillment was totally and completely dependent upon the Lord's faithfulness so uh, the whole thing with supersessionism and repre replacement theology and covenant theology and the, ch the idea the church replaces uh, Israel all of that's negated simply really the, the main reason is because of these promises and the unconditional promises of the Abrahamic Palestinian Davidic and New Covenant they guarantee that God is not going to abandon the nation of Israel he says that much in Jeremiah 31 with the New Covenant the whole chapter is emphatic so if that's the case uh, how can you say the church is going to dispossess or displace the, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel it's not going to now the Lord's promise of land to Abraham and his descendants is also found in Genesis chapter 13 14 through 17 and is an extension upon his promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 1 and is thus related to the Abrahamic covenant the Palestinian covenant was a confirmation and an enlargement of the original Abrahamic covenant and amplified the land features of the Abrahamic covenant so let's take a look at these look at Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 very 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 important and when we talk in theology these covenants look at Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 please Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 now the Lord said to Abram this is before he got his name changed to Abraham go forth from your country he lived in the Ur of the Chaldeans down in Iraq area to which today is called Iraq and from your relatives and from your father's house and to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great 
so you shall be a blessing. He did make him a great nation. He did bless him, and he did make his name great. In fact, he's called the father of the He's a, the father of those who believe. The church considers Abraham to be the father of, his, of their faith, like Paul says in Romans 4. Uh, he's revered among the Jews because he's the progenitor of the Jews. He's the first Jew through circumcision, the new racial species. And uh, also he's revered among the Arabs. Uh, you go in the Arab world and he's revered there too. They all say their father's Abraham as well. Well, they should be because... Uh, remember, uh, Abraham, after Sarah died, marries Keturah, has six boys. That's one branch of the Arabs. You have, he had Hagar, uh, the, the bright idea of Sarah, to go into her and provide a child because she was running out of patience with the Lord, fulfilling their promise of a child. And so he has a sex with Hagar, and, uh, and then she has Ishmael, and another branch of uh, Arabs come out of that. That, that, that union, that sexual union. So yeah, he's great among all these branches, the Christians, among the Jews, and among the Arabs. <laughs> so, and then he says, so you should be a blessing, actually, so you should be a blessing. Terrible translation, we studied this. He says, be a blessing by being obedient to me, and then you'll, you'll bring blessing to the nations. Because in your seat, Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. And verse 3 says, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. That's been fulfilled in history. Anybody takes a shot at the Jew, as the, who was the, uh, Abraham's the father of the Jews, really. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, like Hitler, they bear the consequences of doing such a thing. And if you bless the Jew, like our country has been very, the great pro, uh, benefactor of the nation of, of Israel, we've been blessed, I think, in part because of that. Then it says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, his nephew. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. That's pretty old to get uprooted in life. <laughs> I mean, maybe that was the new, maybe, maybe you, the, uh, the equivalent would be 40 years old back then, I don't know. But that's 75 years old to be picked up and go move somewhere else at that age. That must have been a, a tough thing to do. Verse 5, Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Unconditional promise. So he built an altar there to the Lord. Go up now to Genesis chapter 13. Look at uh, Genesis 13, 14. Maybe you had a little bit of a split between uh, Abraham and his not lot nephew. His lot nephew was a little bit, I think, a jerk here. And Abraham was very magnanimous. And you, you pick what you, you want to go because uh, their, their flocks, were, their, their her, the guys who were taking care of their flocks were button heads. So there was not, the land was, uh, they needed more land. And the two, the, the two guys in their flocks couldn't, the land couldn't hold them, so they said, well, let's split up. So Abraham said, instead of picking first, Abraham said, no, you, you take whatever you want. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, it was beautiful, and he had settled down that way. Of course, uh, he didn't walk by faith, he walked by sight, and he ends up paying the consequences of moving to that area. And he knew that was a bad area, by the way. So uh, he w it tells you something about Lot. And so verse 14 says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Now, you know, if you, you could go to the spot where he was, which was high up, we study this in Genesis, and you go there today and you could see all the way to Iraq. <laughs> you can see a long way. So uh, you, you, you and I, we live in a big country. You know, I can't see the Massachusetts if I look out here. But, you know, you, out there, it's not that much. You know, you look at the, the, the portion of land he's looking at. Uh, that's quite a long distance. But um, he could see with the naked eye is, uh, is all the way out there to the, uh, out toward that way in, uh, in Iraq. So he goes out, fire all the land you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Then he says, arise. Now he's going to tell them to do something, 
which would, uh, would express the fact that he has ownership of the land. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. So basically, he's saying you have ownership of this land by telling him to do that. Because in that day, when you acquired a piece of property, or you, you walked the land that you had purchased, okay? That's what he's doing. Now, the interesting thing is, he never, ever got this land in his life. I mean, he, 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 had, a, he had to get a, a, a burial plot for his wife when she died, Sarah. So he never got the promise of land himself. Now, to a certain extent, his descendants after him did, like the nation of Israel, they had a, a portion of it. But ultimately, it's going to be fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ when the, those who are descended from Abraham and have faith, and those who did not uh, have faith in him, uh, faith in the Lord, will receive the promise of the land, and those who live in the, who are a part of the nation of Israel. So there we have the Palestinian covenant there, uh, where the, the land grant to the nation of Israel, it's an unconditional promise. And that Zephaniah 3.20 is saying God's going to fulfill that promise and give them that land. So the Palestinian covenant was not only, uh, it was initially given to Abraham, and then it was confirmed to his son Isaac, and Genesis 26 Verses 3 and 4, it was confirmed to his, Abraham's great, uh, uh, his grandchild, Jacob, in Genesis 3, 35, 12. It was reiterated to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through 8. And Moses described the geographical boundaries of the land in Numbers chapter 34, 1 through 12. And he prophesied of the fulfillment of this land promise during the millennial reign of Christ in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 9. Look at Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. Look at Genesis 26, 1. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerah, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Interesting, he never did that. Jacob left. Abraham uh, had a little bit of lack of faith. He left for a, a while, got into trouble. God delivered him. And, uh, but Isaac, to his credit, never, ever left the land. And then he says in verse 3, even if the famine, because remember Abraham had a famine in his time, and he left the land, and he shouldn't have done that. And I think Isaac learned the lesson. First, Abraham, his father, probably told him, don't ever do that when you have famine. The Lord's testing you. It's verse 3, soldier in, the, in this land, I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Look at chapter 35 now. Genesis chapter 35. Look at uh, Genesis 35, 9. We'll start there. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan or Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come forth for you. That's, this, that's uh, the uh, C plot for the Davidic covenant, which promises David that a descendant of his will be on the throne forever. So that's the start. That's, a, that's, a little, that's, a, that's the C plot of that one, uh, because it's talking about kings. And this was fulfilled. But verse 12, the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. So, and then he, he worshiped God by building a pillar. So there we have the land promises uh, of, uh, promise that the, the uh, 
the Abrahamic and the, polit the land of promises and the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenant reiterated and reconfirmed with Isaac and Jacob. It was also reiterated to Moses. Look at Mo uh, Exodus chapter 6. Verse 1. Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, we study this book in detail. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go, the, the children of Israel. And under compulsion he will drive them out of this land, out of his land. God further spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I remembered my covenant. They are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, aren't they not? Yes. So is Moses. Verse 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the burden of the Egyptians. Uh, go to, uh, let's see, go to Numbers, I think I want to have you go. Look at Numbers, chapter 34. Look at Numbers 34.1. So we have the geographical boundaries described for us in verses 1 through 12 of this chapter. Gen uh, Numbers chapter 34, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, even the land of Canaan according to its borders. Your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin along the side of Edom, and your southern border shall extend from the end of the Salt Sea eastward. Then your border shall turn direction from the south to the ascent of uh, Akrabim and continue to Zin, and its termination shall be to the south of Kadesh Barnea, and it shall reach Hazar Radar and c continue to Asman. The border shall turn direction from Asmon to the brook of Egypt, and its termination shall be at the sea. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea, that is, its coastline. This shall be your western border, the Mediterranean. And this shall be your northern border. You shall draw your border line from the great sea to Mount Hor. You shall draw a line from Mount Hor to Lebo Hamath, and the termination of the border shall be Zadad. And the border shall proceed to Ziphron, and its termination shall be Hazar, and on, and this shall be your northern border. For your eastern border, you shall also draw a line from Hazar and on to Shepham, and the border shall go down to Shepham to Ribla on the east side of Ion. And the border shall go down and reach to the slope on the east side of the Chinnereth. And the border shall go down to the Jordan, and its termination shall be at the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, and this shall be your land according to its borders all around. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. I think we looked at this passage last week because Deuteronomy 30 prophesies the, the, the fulfillment of this Palestine and Abrahamic covenant uh, promises of land to the Jewish people and he promises uh, the fulfillment of this during the millennial reign of Christ which is prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 through 10. So the land grant under the Palestinian covenant will, when it's ultimately fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ, will contain most of the land of Turkey most of East Africa, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Amman, and the Red Sea, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. The land grant has boundaries on the Mediterranean Sea, Aegean Sea, the Euphrates River, and the Nile River. We'll see this in the map in a, in a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 30, 1 through 10, describes seven features of the Palestinian covenant. We'll look at these in a moment. One, the nation we plucked off the land for its unfaithfulness. Two, There'll be a future repentance of Israel. Number three, Israel's, Israel's Messiah will return. 
Number four, Israel will be restored to the land. Number five, Israel will be converted as a nation. Number six, Israel's enemies will be judged. And lastly, number seven, the nation will then receive her full blessing. All of that is contained in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, please. So it shall be when all of these things, the curse and the blessing he talked about in chapters 28 and 29, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord has banished you, the Lord God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God, repent, and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, as we saw in Matthew 25, 31, 24, 31. And from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Exodus generation, or the children of the Exodus generation, I should say. And shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, there's regeneration, and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand and the offspring of your body and the offspring of your cattle and the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. So we see here as the, uh, the promise of the fulfillment of this covenant of land, this promise of land, the Palestinian Abrahamic covenant, and it will be literally fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ. The prophets of Israel, the prophets of uh, we said, uh, the prophets of Israel have uh, prom uh, predicted the literal and ultimate fulfillment of this promise of land to the remnant of Israel. Now, the Lord's promises uh, that this land would be given to Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants. And this promise was fulfilled to a certain extent, not completely, but to a certain extent, by Israel under Joshua. Uh, Joshua you can read Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. Compare that with Joshua 13, 1 through 7. It was also, to a certain extent, fulfilled under David and Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 20 through 25. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9, 8. However, like a lot of predictions and prophecy in the Bible, you have a near fulfillment or an initial fulfillment, but ultimately you have an ultimate fulfillment, a complete fulfillment with the millennial reign of Christ or the second advent of Christ so often in prophecy. So again, the prophets of Israel, they prophesied of the Palestinian covenants, literal and ultimate fulfillment during the millennial reign of Christ. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 through 16. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 3 through 8. Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses, verse 8, and then verses 31 through 37. Ezekiel 11, 17 through 21. Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Joel chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Amos, as we read earlier, uh, we, yeah, did we really read Amos earlier? Yeah. Amos 9, 11 through 15. Micah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I think we saw that last evening. And of course, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. And you also Zechariah 8, verses 4 through 8, just to name a few. Now, during the millennial reign of Christ, the northern, during the millennial reign of Christ, the northern boundary of Israel will extend from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River, according to Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 15 through 17, incorporating much of Lebanon and what is known today as Lebanon and Syria. The eastern border will extend uh, south from the Euphrates River, incorporating the Golan Heights and portions of Syria, almost up to Damascus, and continuing south to where the Jordan River leaves the Sea of Galilee. 
The river will be the eastern border to the Dead Sea's southern end. That's according to Ezekiel 47, 18. From there, the southern border will go westward, incorporating the Negev and parts of uh, Sinai all the way along the brook of Egypt to the point where it reaches the Mediterranean Sea, according to Ezekiel 47, 19. And the western border, Ezekiel 47, 20. Now, although the land will have tr 12 tribal divisions, these subdivisions will differ from those that are found in the book of Joshua. Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 1 through 7, describes the northern subdivisions for the seven of the 12 tribes. From the, these, these verses teach us that from the north to the south, they will be Dan, that's verse 1 of chapter 48, Asher, verse 2, Naphtali, verse 3, Manasseh, verse 4, Ephraim, verse 5, Reuben, verse 6, and Judah, verse 7. Ezekiel chapter 48 verses 8 through 22 describes the holy mountain which will be south of Judah and north of Benjamin separating the northern and southern tribes. Now Ezekiel chapter 48 verses 23 through 29 describes the subdivisions of the remaining five tribes in the south. From north to south there'll be Benjamin, Ezekiel 48, 23, Simeon, verse 24, Issachar, verse 25, Zebulon, verse 26, Gad, uh, verse 27, and next to the southern border. So let's look at uh, Ezekiel 48. This will be our last passage. Now, that map th that I gave you, distribution of land, why don't you pull that out now before we read this chapter? Now, you can see this map. This is from Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice's book, Charting the End Times, which I highly recommend. It's, it's actually very well done. It's kind of a takeoff on Clarence Larkin's dispensational book back in the early part of the 20th century. It was a, that was brilliant, what he did there, Larkin. You can get that book still from his estate. And uh, also, uh, this the book by Tommy Ice and Tim LaHaye was a great, it was excellent. A uh, lot of great charts in there. It's an excellent way to learn prophecy and actually the Bible. It's a great, it's a great, it's very illustrative, it's very colorful, it's done very well. I highly recommend it. You should have it in your library. And uh, so I think the only thing I really, there's only a couple things I really disagree with them on the thing. I think one of them is the timing of the, uh, is the invasions of uh, uh, the northern, um, you know, uh, Gog, Magog, and Ezekiel 38 and 39. I think they think it's at the beginning before the tribulation period or just before this 70th week. So I don't agree with that. But anyways, other than that, I mean, it's just a great book. A, great, great, a lot of great charts. And you can see on this, you see the Mediterranean Sea on the left. And then you can see how it, you can see it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, all the different the tribes there. And uh, the prince's portion is actually, of course, talking about, um, either probably talking about David or the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, there you have the, 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 the distribution of land. And if you notice, the land stretches all the way to the Euphrates River, where Iraq is today. Notice that? That's quite a ways. All the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and then you're into the northern Egypt, or northern Africa it goes into. And then it goes, all, see how far north it goes there? Uh, with, uh, up into uh, past Syria and stuff. So it's, it's and into, uh, heading into Turkey area. So there you have, that's quite a large portion that the nation of Israel will have. They'll have the whole Middle East. <laughs> They'll have the whole Middle East during the millennial reign of Christ. They're going to win in the end because of the Lord. So look at Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 1. You know what, I'm going to read, let's, let's read, for the, I'm going to read from the Net Bible. Ooh, I have this thing. I have all these translations open, right? And I have this thing where when I turn, when I, I turn to, let's say, Ezekiel 48, all the other ones, all the, all the translations go at the same time over to, you know, it's pretty cool. I'll show you later. They all go to the same verse when I go to it because I have this way I can do it. You don't care. Look at Ezekiel 48, verse 1. These are the names of the tribes from the northern end beside the road of Hethlon to Lebo Hamath, 
as far as Hazar Anan, which is on the border of Damascus towards the north beside Hamath, extending from the east side to the west. Dan will have one portion. Next to the border of Dan, from the east side to the west, Asher will have one portion. Next to the border of Asher, from the east side to the west, Naphtali will have one portion. Next to the border of Naphtali, from the east side to the west, Manasseh will have one portion. Next to the border of Manasseh, from the east side to the west, Ephraim will have one portion. Next to the border of Ephraim, from the east side to the west, Reuben will have one portion. Next to the border of Reuben, from east to side to the west, Judah will have one portion. Next to the border of Judah, from the east side to the west, will be the allotment you must set apart. It is to be eight and a quarter miles wide. Now, here's one of the reasons why I love the Net Bible in the Old Testament. And we did a, 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 a Exodus. They, their translations, they, you know, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the distances, they put it in miles and things that English-speaking people can understand. And, you know, you don't have cubits and all that stuff. They put it in our measurements. That's, that's the great thing about what they do. One of the great things about the Net Bible is they did that with the Old Testament. That's why I'd, I'd rather, if I'm going to read the Old Testament, I like reading the Net Bible, the Old Testament in the Net Bible, more than any other Bible. Because of that. Like, you know, the measurements of the Ark of the Covenant and all that stuff that we studied in Exodus. They have all that in modern measurements. They, tra they convert it for you. You know, we don't have to deal with cubits. What's a cubit, right? So they, they do all that for you. So verse 8, next to the border of Judah from the east side of the west will be the allotment you must set apart. It's to be eight and a quarter miles wide and the same length as one of the tribal portions from the, from the east side to the west. The sanctuary will be in the middle of it. The allotment you set apart to the Lord will be eight and a quarter miles in length and three and one quarter miles in width. These will be the allotments for the holy portion. For the priest towards the north, eight and a quarter miles in length. Towards the west, three and one uh, third miles in width. Towards the east, three and one third miles in width. And towards the south, eight and a quarter miles in length. The sanctuary of the Lord will be in the middle. This will be for the priests who were set apart from the descendants of Zadok, who kept my charge and did not go astray when the people of Israel strayed off like the Levites did. It will be their portion from the allotment of the land, a most holy place next to the border of the Levites. Along the border of the, of the priests, the Levites will have an allotment eight and a quarter miles in length and three and one third miles in width. The whole length will be eight and a quarter miles and the width three and one third miles. They must not sell or exchange any of it. They must not transfer this portion of land for it is set apart to the Lord. The remainder, one and two thirds miles and width and eight and a quarter miles in length will be for common use by the city for houses and for open space. The city will be in the middle of it. These will be its measurements. The north side will be one and a half miles. The south side, one and a half miles. The east side, one and a half miles. The west side, one and a half miles. The city will have open spaces. On the north, there'll be 437 and a half feet. On the south, 437 and a half feet. On the east, 437 and a half feet. And on the west, 437 and a half feet. The remainder of the length alongside the holy allotment will be three and one third miles to the east and three and one third miles towards the west and it will be beside the holy allotment. Its produce will be for food for the workers of the city. The workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel will cultivate it. The whole allotment will be eight and a quarter miles square. You must set apart the holy allotment with the possession of the city. The rest on both sides of the holy allotment and the property of the city will belong to the prince, extending from the eight and a quarter miles of the holy allotment to the east border and westward from the eight and a quarter miles to the west border alongside the portions, it will belong to the prince. The holy allotment and the sanctuary of the temple will be in the middle of it. The property of the Levites and of the city will be in the middle of it of that which belongs to the prince, the portion between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin will be for the prince. The prince could be speaking of Christ, which I think, or King David, I think it's the Lord. Verse 23, as for the rest of the tribes, from the east side to the west side, Benjamin will have one portion. Next to the border of Benjamin, from the east side to the west side, Simeon will have one portion. Next to the border of Simeon, from the east side to the west side, Ishakah will have one portion. Next to the border of Ishakah, from the east side to the west side, Zebulon will have one portion. Next to the border of Zebulun, from the east side to the west side, Gad will have one portion. Next to the border of Gad, at the south side, the border will run from Tamar to the waters of Meribath, Kadesh, to the stream of Egypt, and on to the great sea. This is the land which you will allot to the tribes of Israel, and these are their portions 
declares the sovereign Lord. And that will be allotted to the tribes of Israel during the millennial reign of Christ. So all of this guarantees, is telling us, God plans to restore the nation of Israel to the land permanently with its Messiah King ruling in her over all the nations of the earth. God is going to keep his promise. So uh, the church is not dispossessed uh, Israel. Israel is going to get everything that God's promised uh, her, and in particular, those Jews who compose this remnant of believing Jews in the nation. And what a great uh, future the nation of Israel has. And uh, we, should, uh, we, should, uh, we should continue to pray for the Jewish people, and we should, uh, when get an opportunity, evangelize the Jewish people. Remember, Paul and the apostles, they all went to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And because the Jews get the priority, because salvation is of the Jews, Jesus taught the woman at the well. So uh, it's very important that we keep the, uh, see that the Jewish people have a great future, and we should pray for the Jewish people. And it just tells you that anti-Semitism has no place in Christianity. A lot of this supersessionism, replacement theology, covenant theology, has, has resulted in persecution of the Jewish people throughout the centuries. And, of course... Uh, the dispensationalists, uh, we believe that there's going to be a national regeneration and a restoration of the Jewish people to the land and that all the promises that we see in the Old Testament for this future, uh, for the, the nation of Israel, promise of land and whatnot and, and having its Messiah and ruling over, over her and over the nations of the earth and Israel as head of the nations and being uh, uh, receiving fame and praise from the Gentile nations all of that's going to be fulfilled. The Old Testament expectation of the millennial reign, which Jesus, uh, the Jewish people were expecting to Jesus to fulfill in his, during his first advent, will be fulfilled through Jesus in his millennial reign during the millennial reign of Christ. Of course, they didn't see the cross uh, came before the crown. Even his own disciples didn't see that. So uh, tomorrow, we're going to wrap up this study of the book of Ze uh, verse 20 of Zephaniah chapter 3, and thus the study of the book of Zephaniah. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson would be a blessing to your people. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.